Thanks. Helene Gale, I love this organization. It's a great organization. Uh, I'm old enough to barely remember references to care packages, which started this organization after World War II, when Americans took a look at Europe uh, in the rubble of the war and said, we're going to help feed those people. And that phrase, care package, became synonymous with compassion and giving and hope. And you carry on that tradition. Here we are some 65 years later. You carry on that tradition. And in doing that, uh, you are really speaking not only of yourselves and your own values, but of our values as a nation. I'm a lucky person. I'm one of few people in the history of the United States to ever have this title. And uh, I truly enjoy the opportunity to serve as a senator from a great state like Illinois to be involved, as they say, in the actions and passions of our time, to be in the middle of the big debates, you know, to get an opportunity to express yourself uh, on the Senate floor uh, and on all these media opportunities. But, you know, like any other job, you need to recharge the batteries. You need to regain the inspiration that brought you to public life from time to time. And over the course of a career in Congress, I have thought about what does that for me. Certainly going home and meeting people in my state, some amazing people with wonderful life stories, uh, leads me to get involved in some of these legislative battles with added enthusiasm. But I've also found, and I'll bet many of you have as well, that if you want to be inspired, you go to the poorest places on earth. Not to the great capitals of Europe, God bless them, they're fun to go to and go to restaurants and museums. But for me, it's trips to Africa and trips to South America and Central America, where you literally go to visits uh, like Senator Sherrod Brown and I did just a few weeks ago. We hear these, this conversation about child brides, girls married too soon, and I think about a visit to Goma. What I found surprising was how many people came up to me and said, no one ever comes back to Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I said, I had to, because it is one of these places on earth that you think, God, what are you thinking? These poor people facing poverty and disease and war and homelessness, and did I mention a volcano, try to survive from day to day. And years ago when I went there to a place called Doc's Hospital, and Dr. Um, Joe Lucy and his wife Lynn had this tiny hospital which has now been expanded. And I want to say the First Lady, uh, former First Lady Hillary Clinton, who spoke to you, our Secretary of State, also made this journey uh, just a few weeks before I did. And when you go into the wards of this hospital and you see the women uh, who are being treated free, given surgeries, there was a University of Wisconsin group that was there, uh, doctors and residents who were training and giving of their professional expertise. And you realize that so many of them are there for obstetric fistula, which can be the result of some cruel assault or perhaps a pregnancy too soon on a very young woman. And they are shunned, of course, with this fistula from their families and their villages. And they walk miles and miles in desperation to come here and hope that they might be able to sit by the side of the dusty road and someday get inside for a surgery sometimes multiple surgeries, and they go back to the road and then back for another surgery. And when you go to Heal Africa in Goma and you see this, you realize why we need to move forward to make sure that we stand as a nation against the practices that lead to these young girls being drafted into marriage long before they've reached any age of consent or opportunity. And that is part of the learning experience that we've all had who've been there, and it's part of why care makes such a difference. I think, too, of the global aid struggle that you're involved in as well. I remember my first attempt to go to Africa was back when I was a member of the House of Representatives, and a fellow named Hard Wolpe was the chairman of the Africa subcommittee, and he asked me, would you like to go to Africa? And I said, I've never been there. I would love to. We applied for visas. And because we had voted against the apartheid government in South Africa, they turned us down. So my efforts to go to Africa didn't result in a trip until much later. 
And I went there as a senator about 14 years ago to look at microcredit programs and food programs. I was absolutely overwhelmed by the global AIDS epidemic and what it was doing to countries like Kenya and Uganda and just across the board, Botswana, so many other places that I visited. And I said, I'm going to do something about it. And I came back and started the Global AIDS Caucus uh, on Capitol Hill just to try to heighten the awareness of my colleagues of what was happening at the time. And then I proceeded to make myself a genuine pain in the neck to my <laughs> colleagues every time a president would propose a global AIDS budget for PEPFAR or for Global Fund, I would come in and say, no, I want more. And I would force my Senate colleagues to vote, and they hated me for it because they didn't want to vote against this, and they ended up voting for it. And over the span of four or five years, we added literally $1 billion to the global AIDS effort, effort with these amendments. The reason I tell you that story is because you're going to walk into the offices of congressmen and senators. Sometimes you'll only see the staff person, but sometimes they may be the most important person in the office when it comes to that elected member's decision. And you're going to meet people who, because you are dedicated and inspired, will also be inspired. Don't believe for a second you're wasting your time to reach out to these offices and to tell them how much these issues mean to you personally really makes a difference, literally makes a difference. And make sure your own home congressmen and, and your own state's uh, U.S. senators know that you're involved and you care and you've given of your time today to try to persuade them. Now, I, I think Hillary Clinton made a speech in Chicago, which she's probably forgotten and I will never forget, many years ago. And she was first lady and came into town for a, a dinner honoring a friend of mine and I went to the dinner, and she stood up and gave a speech about a recent trip to India. And she said something which has stuck with me that I really believe is kind of a, a clarion call in terms of what we're doing. She said, if I could go to the poorest country on earth and only ask one question to determine whether or not they had a chance, a chance to move forward socially, to address the serious challenges and problems of their day, and to literally move with progress, it would be this, how do you treat your women? How do you treat your women? And if your women are treated like property or slaves, then it'll be a long time before you get a chance to really see the progress that you need. When it comes to elevating the status of women and families, when it comes to dealing with issues of poverty, issues of disease, the problems of homelessness, all of these things, CARE has been there for 65 years and will be there for many more after we've come and gone because people just like you stood up in 1945 and said we can make a difference and now you're standing up in the year 2010 to make that same difference. I am honored to be with you today. I salute you for your work. Don't be discouraged even in these difficult economic times because a caring people in the United States of America need to hear your voice and to realize that what you stand for are the values that make us a great nation. Thank you very much.